One, two, three. <laughs> Welcome to the Mental Reps Podcast featuring your host, Brian Wright. Tell me if you can, Eric, how Dr. Jack Ramsey came on board and what it was like working with that great man. I guess this episode is TV play-by-play announcer for the Miami Heat, Eric Creed. Teaming with Jack Ramsey, when I first heard I was like, wow. I knew a lot about Jack just as an NBA fan. What I did not know was how blessed not only I was, but all of us in Heat Nation were to have that man come into our life for eight seasons. We shared over 500 games together. He's just an extraordinary man. Jack passed away a few years ago. I think one of the great honors of my life was being one of the speakers at his funeral. This week's episode is sponsored by the Field Irish Pub and Eatery, a little piece of island in South Florida, as well as elite sanitizing services keeping South Florida clean and in business. What made Jack so great as a broadcaster, in my opinion, was his knowledge combined with his warmth. I've never heard anybody interview players with more knowledge and sincerity and warmth than Jack Ramsey. Now fade out that fresh as beat and let's get this show on the road. Welcome to Mental Reps Podcast. I'm Brian Wright. I hope you're happy and healthy. Thank you so much for listening watching supporting the show our numbers keep going up it's all thanks to you guys so really cannot thank you enough we keep that rolling for a little bit incredible job guys make sure you're following us on all the uh, social medias mental reps pod on ig mental reps show on twitter and uh please share the podcast with your friends this is a grassroots operation and uh, we need your help so good looking out you can also email the show at mental reps podcast at gmail.com my guest today is the emmy award-winning tv play-by-play announcer for the miami heat a south florida sports icon eric reed yeah that eric reed he's been with the the heat since day one he served alongside the legendary dr jack ramsey much of the 90s, uh, Tony Fiorentino for about 15 years till about three years ago. Now he sits alongside Virginia great and uh, ex-Heat point guard John Crotty in the booth. And the man has called over 2,200 Heat games. He's a great statesman for the Miami Heat, a great family man and a South Florida treasure. I know you'll enjoy my chat with the mayor of Kaboomtown, Eric Reed. Uh, but first... We have to give a special shout out to our official sponsors, South Florida's authentic Irish pub and eatery, The Field. Got to go to thefieldfl.com, enter code word REPS20, and get 20% off your entire online order. Go get it. We have some live events coming up at The Field I can't wait to tell you about. It's a little piece of Ireland right here in South Florida. From the bus boys to the amazing servers, the bartenders, Keith and Carey, the GMJ, all the way up to the owner, Hillary. All salt of the earth, top-notch human beings whose uh, main goal is just to provide you with the best, safest, authentic Irish experience in South Florida. They are like the Miami Heat organization, but a restaurant, like from the top down, just ran the right way. We're talking full bars, Jameson, Guinness, Smithicks, Irish car bombs. Yes, you can sip slowly uh, and enjoy the surroundings, but... It's one of my favorite places to tie one off and then cut loose. So just get your DD or uh, Uber lined up and embrace the Irish within you. You can do that as well. But of course, uh, they also have the authentic Irish American cuisine, shepherd's pie, corned beef, cabbage. Uh, They got Irish potato soup. It's the stuff of legends. Like for real, this stuff is so damn good. They also have steaks, chops, fresh seafood, something for the whole crew. Plus live music five nights a week with real irish music thursdays fridays and saturdays they are extremely safe with the whole pandy guidelines everything is being run on the up and up so please go stop by the field and tell them we sent you it's at 3281 griffin road in fort lauderdale 954-964-5979 is their number and if you aren't feeling up to going out go to the field fl.com enter code word reps 20 For 20% off your entire online order, go use that and take advantage while you can. They'll even bring it out to the car for you if you like. So get those mason jars and growlers to go, which again, super cool and acceptable now. Just wait to indulge until you get home. But for real, don't sleep. Go to thefieldfl.com. Enter code word REPS20 for 20% off your entire online order. 
Also, here's another great company run by amazing people. If you're looking for local sanitizing services here in South Florida, call ESS Elite Sanitizing Services. They're state licensed and insured, offering local sanitizing services, which kill 99.9% of all the bacteria and viruses, including COVID-19. They actually provided their services to the field. Again, super safe and clean. Uh, if you need to keep your property, employees, customers safe and virus free, let them help keep you in business keep your employees working they offer services for schools churches medical facilities offices aircrafts yachts public transportation restaurants gyms homes vehicles and a lot more it's kind of like you're running them through a big purell machine and now they're offering free sanitizing to vehicles of all first responders and medical professionals which i just think is like a really cool thing for them to do so please give them a call 1-800-763-4299 visit them at elitesanitize.com or email them at info at elitesanitize.com. Elite Sanitizing Services, keeping South Florida safe and in business. All right, you know what time it is. It is kaboom time here in Miami. <laughs> Please welcome to the show, Eric Reed. Kaboom. Welcome to Mental Refs Podcast. I'm Brian Wright. My guest today is Emmy Award winning voice of the Miami Heat on Fox Sports Sun, where he's been calling games for the Heat since day one in 1988. A true Miami Heat lifer and uh, South Florida sports icon. It's our guy, Eric Reed. How's it going, man? Oh, you are a very kind gentleman, Brian. Now, I'm doing well and I hope you are as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm a guy that's really excited to be back doing his job because, uh, this NBA restart, I think, has exceeded everybody's expectations. The games have been competitive. Uh, the quality of play uh, has been high. And I can't give enough credit to, to Adam Silver and the league for, for coming up with a terrific bubble and, and, a, and a real safe and, and meticulous way to do it. And also to the coaches and players that have given so much of their their time, they've made a great sacrifice in their own lives to, to get this done. And I'm so proud of the players right now because without any stimulus from fans, uh, they're showing you how hard NBA players compete. I, I think it's a great statement about this league. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. How are you calling the games? Are you calling them from the bubble? No, sir. We have our, we, we have our own bubble, as do all, all, 30, all 22 teams involved. Uh, you got your network announcers there, but of the of the 22 teams involved, everybody's doing it remotely. Now, for us, uh, we're equally proud of, of you know Ted Ballard, our our executive producer on the TV side, and everybody with the Heat and the American Airlines Arena. They, I want to tell you, they have created um, as safe, as professional, as productive, um, first class in every way work environment. So. What, what could be a weird situation, it's still weird, trust me. I, mm -hmm. You know, you drive into an empty parking garage, you walk into an empty American Airlines arena uh, with John Crotty. I'm sitting there looking up at the, the retired jerseys and all the empty seats and realizing all these treasured moments we've mm. been building. And, and right now, you know what the comfort is? Knowing that those people are out there and, and we're bringing the games to them on TV and doing the games off monitors, Listen, I will want to make a career out of it, but it's not as difficult as I thought it would be. And I'm doing just what I thought, uh, Brian, in the sense I am attaching myself to the game like I always do. And just like the players, I don't need – I like the home crowd there. I like any crowd there. I don't personally need it to do my job and to mm. do my job well. I, I'm attached to the game and to the home viewer. That's it. And uh, it's still the case. And I'm enjoying it. I really am. And the games have been great. And the Heat has a very good team. I, I think, you know, hopefully healthy at the right time as the playoffs are less than two weeks away. And this is a team with, with high expectations and a lot of confidence and a lot of depth. And uh, we're looking forward to the playoffs. Coming off that big win against the Celtics last time, we needed that one. That was the one that uh, we weren't able to get earlier in the season. They were the one in the Eastern Conference that was really bugging us. We couldn't get, so it was nice to kind of get that monkey off our back yesterday. Like you said, I mean, since this pandemic started, we're finding out more and more every day and reminded how much sports like serve this huge purpose for our lives and the human spirit and that need of normalcy and even if you've been working all day, maybe 
you forgot the game was on that night, but when we turn on the TV and we see you there, you know, making us feel at home and uh, a part of something, it's really special because no joke, man, your, your love for the heat, it's, it's palpable. Uh, I, I just, uh, I, you've really helped instill in me, even in the early days, you know, when with the Ronnie Cycles and uh, Harold Miners, when we were still struggling to kind of become relevant, you were that source that sucked us in as <laughs> South Florida's heat fans and educated us. And uh, I got to say right off the bat, I appreciate that, man. That's so nice of you to express that. I mean, it's the, it's the unique privilege um, we get as a, as a broadcaster for an NBA franchise. I mean, it's a coveted job. We treat it with great respect. Um, I love the NBA. I love pro basketball. You know, as I grew up with it as a kid growing up in New York, my dad was a Knicks season ticket holder. So I feel like this is my second lifetime in the NBA. The first was as a kid growing up in New York and, and, you know, 11 years old watching the Knicks win their first NBA title. And then two years later, they do it again, or three years later, whatever it was. And now all these years later, you know, 32 years with the Heat. And listen, it's extraordinary privilege to have any NBA job. But for me personally, to have started with a team from its expansion season and to still be calling games and uh, to have a, have a sense and a, and a real feel for the, for the whole history of the franchise. And the great thing is there's people like you out there um, that have been with us for the whole ride too. And, and remember Cycli and Sherman Douglas and Glenn Rice and Grant <laughs> Matt Geiger yeah. and, the, and the pride we had in, in building those early teams with young talent. And, and then, you know, as the franchise entering through some, some uh, adolescent years, when the, when the charm of expansion wore off, we, we sort of drifted a little bit into an abyss of mediocrity <laughs> and then been took control of the ownership. I think, I think the years are, are real tangible proof that he's one of the, the great owners in pro sports. Um, proof is in, the, in who he hires. And to have brought Pat Riley in, I think of all the press conferences I've ever been at in 32 years of covering the Heat, the, the Pat Riley introductory press conference on the Carnival cruise ship, <laughs> the imagination made you use your imagination, and it has even exceeded uh, – to, you know, the Heat is truly a world-class organization. Um, and you know what? Always hungry. Oh, three championships, right? But still burning to win more and compete for more. And I think that's why fans love rooting for the Heat. And that's one of the many reasons why we love, you know, working for the Miami Heat. Man, what a blessing Pat Riley has been to this city and this organization. You know, I wanted to talk real quick before we got into uh, some stuff going on with the team now. I know we've crossed paths a few times in the past, but we never got the time to chat. And I just have to say right off the bat, you look healthy, man. You look great. How's the family? How's everybody doing? Everybody's well. Uh, you know, we have two older kids that are out and about in the world. Uh, my oldest daughter, Felicia, Felicia Ross. Uh, outstanding musician and singer. She tours all over the world, non-COVID times. Beautiful. Um, she's doing well, and she, we're so proud of her. Uh, our son, Andrew, is an artist up in the New York City area, and he's pursuing his passion. And my wife and I have a, a younger child who's a, a daughter named Darielle who's on her way into high school. Uh, we're all doing well. You know, it's been a, a crazy last four or five months. And uh, right now, we're just thankful uh, that, that we're well and, uh, and that we're working again and the NBA is back and, and taking it one day at a time, Brian, just like everybody else is. You know, it's funny. I was going through some old pictures of you and uh, I was reminded you were an ambassador of the stash for a long time. I mean, I, I love the goatee. I really do. I like it, but I'd be lying if I told you I didn't miss the flavor saver a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I don't, I don't know how long it's been since I... Screw the goatee, but uh, my family talked me into shaving it off, you know, when we went on a, a summer cruise one summer, and no sooner than I, than I shaved all of it off, uh, I started growing it right back. I don't know. I... <laughs> hey, man, it looks good. I was just saying, I was reminded by that. I said the same thing to Ron McGill. Do you know Ron McGill is of uh, Zoom Miami yes, down here? Yes, Both of you ambassadors of the stash just have to, you know, 
in the appropriate moments, you got to give out props, you know, to these because it's a, it's a commitment. It really is. So, and you stuck with that for a long time. I wanted to talk with you uh, about the current Heat team, but um, as well as the old school days. But I know at first you were an Ithaca guy, right? And you started calling games for Cornell, Providence College, and they end up going on a Final Four run. And so it's 1988. You get a call from an NBA expansion team calling themselves the Miami Heat. Can you tell us a little bit about that process and how that happened? Wow, you you did your homework on me, Brian. Yeah, I, I, I'm I a proud. I'm a proud 1979 Ithaca College grad. Um, I love going to school there, but to be honest with you, I, I loved even more my three years living there after graduating from college. My five-year association with Cornell University was a blessing. I started doing Cornell basketball when I was a junior at Ithaca College uh, on the other hill. And I haven't missed a basketball season since. I think it's 43 straight basketball seasons worked. So that's my blessing. And going from Ithaca to Providence and and moving into the Big East Conference after five years working Ivy League football and basketball and lacrosse, you know, I, I jumped into the Big East in 1982 and was there th- to 88, m- maybe six of the best years any college basketball conference ever had. Changed college basketball. Mm. Um, the great Georgetown, St. John, Syracuse, Villanova. I mean, the conference was loaded. Mm. And I got the, the opportunity in 1987 as the radio announcer for the pro go to uh, an unexpected Final Four trip. You know, Rick Pitino was the coach. Uh, Jeff Van Gundy was his graduate assistant. <laughs> oh, right. wow. I didn't know that. That's Hugh Jackson, Gordon Chiesa, Herb Sendek, one of the best coaching staffs I've ever been around. Wow. And they took a team of, you know, ordinary college players to a, to a Final Four, which was amazing. Billy Donovan was on that team. The other familiar name would be Delray Brooks, a former Indiana Hoosier. And then uh, – you know, life, life is a winding road. I, I had applied for, for a job with the Nets, um, I want to say 1984. And Louis Chaffel was the general manager of the Nets at that time. And, um, you know, I, I, I made a great run at getting that job and didn't. But, uh, you know, maybe four years later or three years later, whatever it was, um, got a call from a close friend of Mr. Chaffel's and they put the feeler out. Uh, and, and I first got interested in the radio job for the expansion Miami heat. And I'll never forget. And I, and listen, I had gotten involved in TV late um, when I was in new England and I moved from, I, I was working radio in Providence and then all of a sudden got into TV in Boston, working for Nesson doing Red Sox pre and post game shows and, and Pawtucket Red Sox games and Boston college football and big East basketball. But I was still at, at my heart. I was a radio guy and I was still doing radio play by play at Providence and, uh, you know, saw a lot of great Big East players come through and, and move to the NBA. And I got my chance. And I, I wanted the radio job. I, I really, that was my goal, to be the best radio guy I could be. I was so into the art of radio play-by-play. Mm. And when I interviewed for the Heat job, uh, you know, I had a great meeting with Mr. Chaffel down on the Chopin Plaza when the Heat had their temporary offices there before the first season. And midway through the conversation, he said, you know, what I'd really like to do is hire a simulcaster um, and do radio and TV together. And there were only maybe three or four teams at that time in the NBA that did Mm. it. Phoenix, the Lakers, the Spurs, and the Utah Jazz were were those teams. And Mr. Chaffel told me, if I can get one of those guys to come to Miami, then I want you to do color on the simulcast. And I left that meeting like dazed and confused because I didn't think I could pull off doing color. Um, And I did color a little bit at Cornell and for a couple of years at Providence, but at the NBA level, I I didn't think that was a a feasible or possible jump. Mm. And, uh, you know, I went back to Providence and and New England and this was before anybody had laptops, Brian, there was no computers in the late eighties. So I got a subscription to the Miami Herald mm-hmm. and it, it got delivered to my, my, my house in Providence would come a day late, but I figured this, if I don't get the job, I, I didn't care at that point. I, mm-hmm. I wanted to keep track of the heat through the, the expansion draft through our first NBA draft. I was intrigued by all this. And if I got the job, I was going to be up to speed. If I didn't get the job, not, I wasn't concerned about that. And then one day, Late July, 
I remember read, opening up my Miami Herald a day late and seeing the article, mm-hmm. Heat hired Sam Smith to do play-by-play on the team's simulcast. And Sam had done that for the Spurs. I, I closed the newspaper. I called up my boss at, at the New England Sports Network. I said, listen, I didn't get the Heat job. Um, you know, I'm back with you guys. I had a great situation at Ness, and they were grooming me to be the next TV voice of the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. I was already doing Boston College football for them. I all of a sudden had a, had a TV platform in Boston. And I was in the middle. I was two or three games into that Boston College football season. And I, I never heard back from the Heat. I just moved on. And I'll never forget this. I got home from playing in a Sunday night summer basketball league. And I, I answered the phone, and it was Louis Chaffel. And I had put the dream to bed, right? And, and Mr. Chaffel said, this guy listen, want? <laughs> you know, I, I, at this point, yeah. I, he says, I remember I told I, I, we hired somebody, but I want you to do the color, but I want you to come down here and meet with the general manager of Sports Channel Florida because he's got college football and college basketball opportunities play by play. And that sort of lit my fuse all over again. And a day later, uh, you know, I, I was meeting with Jeff Gethner and Boca Raton at, at the Sports Channel headquarters, and he laid out the University of Miami football schedule, uh, which they had on a tape delayed package. He also laid out the University of South Florida's college basketball telecast for the following year. And looking at the heat schedule, I could clear like 17 or 18 USF telecasts. So now in my mind, I'm thinking I got play by play of football. Mm -hmm. I got play by play of college basketball. I'm going to keep my skills sharp and I'm going to get my foot in the door with the, with the Miami heat. And I moved down to Miami uh, maybe a week before our first training camp began at the University of Miami. And uh, God bless it. It's amazing how, how fast 32 years have gone by. But I'll be honest with you, Brian, that my appreciation for the job and respect for the job and, and, and our profession, you know, just continues to grow. I, I don't think I've ever enjoyed or been happier doing heat games than I am right now, even with all the championships behind us. It's, it's just a great joy to do it and to interact with the same fan base uh, for all of these years. I love it. You know, it is, it is unique. You know, when I started out in sports and news, uh, objectivity was the name of the day. You, but you have this great ability to be a professional, but you're also given the green light to be a fan as well. And obviously you stay objective, but I think that that has got to be very satisfying being able to do what you do well professionally, but also be able to represent this organization that you've grown to love so much over the years. It's got to uh, feel like a real blessing. It's, it, it is, Brian. It's, it, listen, it's a balancing act of, you know, trusting your sort of your guardrails of knowing what's right and what's not and doing the job the way you think is, is best. And, and I think what you described is what I'm striving to be. I, I want Heat fans to know that I'm, I'm going to convey the emotion of the game, but I'm also going to convey the, the information. And I'm going to tell you about the other team and, and give credit when they deserve it. And, Absolutely. and I, I think I've become more objective and, and even more honest as the years have gone by. But you know who I'm, I'm, I'm working for and with and, and who I'm rooting for. But uh, I, I think we, we pride ourselves on, you know, giving the NBA each game the respect it deserves. And uh, there, there's always two stories to tell, your team and the, and the team you're playing against. That's what gives it flavor. And I just have great respect for the players, the coaches, the officials, and, and for the viewers that are enjoying NBA basketball on a nightly basis. No, it, we can tell. We can tell that you do not rest on your laurels and you uh, really do care about doing a, a good job. I know you've, like you said, that you started – doing color commentary for the first three years. Obviously, we all know you as the play-by-play man, but the first three years you're doing color uh, with Sam Smith. You take over play-by-play, 91 uh, with Dave Wall doing color, then Destiny comes knocking in 1992. Tell me if you can, Erica, how Dr. Jack Ramsey came on board and what it was like working with that great man. You ask great questions. First of all, do, doing color the first three years, you know who helped me more than any single person? Ron Rossi. Mm. And I, I, I try to tell this story as often as I can. The access he afforded me those first three years was extraordinary. I, back then, I was at almost every practice. Uh, there were several coaching film sessions that he let me sit in on. I, I had a good knowledge base of, of, 
of basketball in general and the NBA overall, but he accelerated that and, and really helped me pull that off. Um, you know, year four with Dave Wall was, that was my first year doing play by play with the heat. It was the first year the heat made the playoffs and it was the last year we, we simulcasted. So that, I'll always ha- that season's always close in my heart for those reasons. The first first playoff appearance mm. and a chance to do it on radio and TV. That was a really cool experience for, for uh, a radio guy at heart. Teaming with Jack Ramsey, you know, when uh, when I first heard, I was like, wow. You know, he was my dad had passed away uh, the year before I got the heat job. Jack was probably in my father's age bracket. And so I knew a lot about Jack just as an NBA fan. What I did not know was how blessed not only I was, but all of us in Heat Nation were to have that man uh, come into our life for eight seasons. We shared over 500 games together. We bridged the, the Kevin Lockery era into the beginning of the Pat Riley regime in Miami. And, um, He's just an extraordinary man. Jack passed away a few years ago. I think one of the great honors of my life was being one of the speakers at his, at his funeral. Um, I'm so thankful for the, for the meaningful time that we shared. Uh, so many incredible experiences. But as a broadcaster, what, what I'll always love about Jack, and we had some of the funniest moments ever doing TV <laughs> yeah, together, did. right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to try to tell you one in a minute. But, but what made Jack so great as a broadcaster, in my opinion, was number one, how smart he was. He was a basketball genius. Um, but so his knowledge combined with his warmth. I've never heard anybody interview players uh, with more knowledge and sincerity and warmth than Jack Ramsey. So uh, it was amazing to, to share that time with him. You know, my, my favorite Jack Ramsey story, we're doing a game in San Antonio together and the stage manager is a man or woman. They sit next to the broadcasters and they're the ones that hand you the cards to read for promos and, you know, different things that, 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 that to aid in the broadcast. And that particular night, it was, uh, you know, a middle-aged lady, an attractive middle-aged woman. And uh, as she's handing me, leaning across Jack to hand me a card uh, to read as we're coming back on the air, just as we come off commercial and back on the air, you hear Jack say, Mmm, you smell good. <laughs> and I followed it with, thanks, coach. You smell good, too. <laughs> there you go. I love it. That's so great. He really was just a ma- – I mean, the two of you together were magic, man. And, I mean, him coming off of being winning a championship as a, a GM with Philly, then a coach in, in Portland, and coming down here, just, I mean, all the great calls, Zoe with the stuff uh, I mean, oh, you, Leonard, you, oh God, this away, that away, hard away, everything. I'm just uh, magical. And uh, you guys, I mean, we were so fortunate as fans in South Florida. I mean, looking back in that tandem, just personally, I mean, obviously Tony Fiorentino for 15 years, an incredible run. I love that man. But I just really do believe you two working together for those years, I mean, it really cemented uh, my love as a Heat fan. And I just knew no matter what, again, like I said, you guys were always there. And, you know, it is funny, just growing up, arguably I've heard you speak more than just about any other human being. And while you think about, you know, growing up with late night talk show hosts, Conan was kind of like my Johnny Carson. But I have heard you speak more than just about anybody. And you've served as this kind of beautiful constant in my life, man. I, I, I've got to tell you that. I, and I know that I'm not the only one. And just knowing that we've had you here, it gives us uh, comfort as fans. And just like I said, as human beings, how much we know that sports have this huge effect on us in the human spirit. So again, I just got to, I have to thank you for that and all the beautiful memories that you provided for me. And I feel uh, confident speaking for the rest of Heat Nation in that. Thank you, Brian. I, I think, listen, you're hitting on this, this sort of sacred bond that a, a broadcaster has with the fan base of the team he is broadcasting for. And, the, and, you know, what makes my relationship with Heat fans unique is we've both been in it from the start. And 
it's 32 years of history and and uh people welcoming me into their homes via the tv set and we're enjoying you know miami heat nba basketball together but uh you know the, the ramsey partnership uh you know that that was the partnership of a lifetime you mentioned tony fiorentino think about it. i had 23 years sitting next to ramsey and then <laughs> tony um two of the great friendships of my lifetime you know how much basketball i i, I learned a lot about basketball mm. uh, i also learned a, a great deal about life um from both uh from both tony has a unique set of experiences as a high school teacher and coach in mount vernon new york we we both grew up in the northeast and you know heat originals and that we were so proud when we when we would go around the nba with the heat tony and i were so proud because we had this sort of unofficial title that we gave ourselves we never talked about it with anybody else but we knew that we were the only broadcast team in the league where both announcers were original employees of the franchise mm -hmm. and that was a great source of pride for both of us um no matter where we went you know like Nobody ever, nobody ever uh, ordained us heat, heat ambassadors, but that's the way we felt. And whether you played for the team for one week or 10 years, um, you know, when we saw you, we, we were going to relive your time with you and always make you feel still attached to it. One of the great stories I could tell you to illustrate that was, I think it was my last season with Tony. So that's three years ago. And it's about an, an hour and a half before the game. And you know, Tony and I are talking and we, we look about 10 feet away as a, a tall black gentleman who looked athletic and looked vaguely familiar, but I, I didn't recognize him. And I turn around and, and the next thing I know, I, I turn back and now Tony is talking to the guy and the guy looks at me and he says, E, you remember me? And I don't know who was happier, him or me, but I said, Sil? It was Sylvester Gray. He played one year with the Miami Heat. The first year, he oh. was a rookie power forward from Memphis State, right? Wow. It was his only year in the NBA. And when I saw him three years ago, he was 50 years old, had just finished his professional career in Italy, had never been back to Miami until that night. He was, he was back in town. He said he was filming a documentary of his life. I don't know how I even recognize him um, or what tipped me off that it was Sylvester Gray, but uh, that's a that's deep how, cut. That is how far back it, it, it goes. So when I run into a Sherman Douglas or a Brian Shaw or a Steve Smith or whomever it is, and I think, you know, it's funny, you, you mentioned, you know, my gift of longevity with the heat. Listen, I, I spend most of my professional life doing one thing, getting ready for the next game. And that's how the year, I'm just always getting ready for the next game. I mean, the minute I get off with you, I'm, I'm diving back in for, to finish my prep for tomorrow. But when Dwayne Wade's career ended, you know, I, I think of all the games I've done, two of the games that are, the mo are most meaningful to me were his last two games. You know, the 30-point home finale against Philly. And then you thought, like, how can anybody top that? And then 24 hours later, he did on a sore knee, you know, gets his like six triple double of his career. And that was one of the most, I, I called it the greatest 19 point loss in, in heat history. Mm. Nobody cared that we lost the game. It was this coronation celebration culmination of the greatest career that, that he nation, in my opinion, will ever see. I, I listen, I hope somebody, duplicates or exceeds it. I'm not sure that'll ever happen, that, that somebody will lay down 14 years of that quality of work and, and the championships and the gold medals and the big three. But, but when it ended, uh, you know, I, I realized how significant Dwayne was for all of us, certainly in my career as the as play-by-play -play announcer. I always felt like he always gave me the compliment that I made his best plays sound better. And I know he made me a much better announcer just by simply calling the amazing things that he did. But when it all ended, I was like, wow, you know, I had a moment to think like my voice um, is a big part of the soundtrack to what's going to be his Hall of Fame career and this iconic Miami career. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for that and a million other things in regard to to my my longevity with the Miami Heat.
that game where he hit the game winner versus Golden State, I was there with my brother, who was the season ticket holder. Only bummer was I couldn't hear you do the call live. That was what a way to just put a, a cap, a little cherry on top of an incredible career. Really quick, before we get into the new stuff, we got to talk old school. He just for a second, obviously, I mean, coming up, Tim Hardaway, Glenn Rice, Zoe, all the standouts, uh, Dan Marley, all these great players. Who, in your opinion, before we get to the current uh, crew, who is your most underrated Heat player Ooh. in history? That's hard. Mm. That is hard. I, you know, I, I would say Chris Bosh. Mm. Chris Bosh. That's the, 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 the jump right. out, uh, the jump right out of my brain and my mouth uh, there for you. Because – you know, as celebrated he as he was as a Raptor, you know, as an individual coming here, um, you know, he sacrificed the most of those three stars and did all the little things like grab the biggest rebound in franchise history, uh, come up with the greatest closeout when he blocked Danny Green's potential, you know, go ahead score or game tying score, um, did all the little things, gave his heart and soul every, every time he played and was the overlooked member of, of that big three. And, you know, I, it was sad the way it got unplugged so suddenly for him. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm really happy for Chris that, you know, he's so embedded as a great family man, as a husband and as a dad. And I'm glad he's reinvested himself in other things. He, you know, as as he passed through, you, you got to see about him that he would probably be as ready as any uh, and more ready than most for a life after basketball. Unfortunately, it happened for him sooner than he was ready, but um, I'm so happy he's comfortable with, with all of it now. And he's a big part of, of the heat past, of, of the glorious past, and, and hopefully he's going to be a presence with the franchise for a long time to come. I, I know he left a, a lasting you know, footprint for all of us. That's a great answer. All right, let's talk about this young, hungry uh, Heat team for a bit. We're finally getting to see a healthy hero and Leonard Drag- uh, Dragic all play alongside these new additions and Iguodala and Crowder specifically. Obviously, we know like Spo likes to play with the lineups, so we have much more to see come playoff time. But uh, what of these first few games back, including that crucial win uh, Tuesday versus the Celtics. Uh, told you about the chemistry of the team and uh, potential where we might be headed. I think great chemistry, Brian. And when you think about it, it's a new team, not just this year. It changed dramatically in February when you, when you send out Dion and James Johnson and Justice Winslow and you get back Andre Iguodala, Jay Crowder, and Solomon Hill. At that time, you had lost Myers Leonard and Tyler Hero. and now. Uh, you know, it was interesting to hear Brad Stevens, the Celtics coach last night, uh, talk about it. First of all, he was so complimentary of Coach Spolstra and of the Heat. He said it's another typical, well-coached, hard-playing, competitive team. We shoot the three ball great. We defend better than most teams. Um, but he, he talked about, listen, we started big most of the year. Myers Leonard started all 49 games he played in. He and Bam were a good duo, very good. Uh, mm. Part of a starting group that went 28 and 10 together, 28 and 11. But, you know, the, what, what happened, when you, when you get an Iguodala and a Jay Crowder, you have fortified your wing and your perimeter players. They're the dominant players in the league right now, uh, position-wise. And the Heat became quicker, more athletic, better defensively, more versatile, and changed for the better, and yet can still play big when either they, either they have to, need to, or, or want to. So, um, I, I listen, I, I think it's coming together at the right time. If they can stay healthy, um, you know, this team has high expectations for itself. Listen, we're they're trying to get it right. I think, you know, Seating and home court doesn't mean as much. Home court means nothing right now. Seating, it doesn't matter four or five. You know, you, you can get Philadelphia. If, if, you, if the Heat got to three, they could get Philly at six. Mm-hmm. Uh, the more likely scenario, probably Miami and Indiana. we got two games next week with the Pacers. T.J. Warren, Jimmy Butler's nemesis, uh, mm-hmm. the hottest player in the bubble. I mean, he had a 53-point game. He scored 30-plus again That's yesterday. 
I, I mean, these two games next week against them and a potential first round series um, are going to be excellent, excellent competition. But listen, so we'll see when we get there. But this Heat team is, trust me, and you know it by watching. This is not a team that is contented by simply having a ticket to the playoffs. They want to they want to stay in that bubble for a while, and they want to burst some other people's bubbles. You know, I'm so happy that UD continues to lead this team, and I just, you know, I think he's going to be a coach when it's all said and done, right? He kind of already is. But I'm hearing a lot of people from the Heat say Bam could be his successor in that respect, like a torchbearer of the Miami Heat culture. Uh, if you will. So tell me your thoughts just a little bit on Bam's improvement, not only on the court, but off the court. So we love having UD around too. He's iconic. Number 40 will be in the rafters, you know, one day, not, not in the not too far off future. And even though most of his playing days are probably done, uh, the mentorship, the leadership, um, the camaraderie, uh, the, the sort of the roadmap of, of how, to how to be and what a heat player is all about but bam is the next one and i hope bam has that kind of longevity in miami he's he's a franchise dream and and really he's a coach's dream he is a teammate dream because the guy's just beginning to scratch at the, the level of of stardom he's going to achieve he's unselfish he's motivated by winning he's trying to be great um He's incredibly versatile as both a defensive player and guard every position. Uh, his offense is only going to get better. It's already very good. He's starting to make his jumper. He's, uh, you see fear in other big men's eyes when he advances with the ball. And now you're seeing teams changing the way they're defending him. Toronto used OJ on a um, Boston last night used Marcus Smart and the Celtics pay for that last night. You, you can't, I don't think you can guard Bam with a smaller player. He'll, 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 he'll eat that man's lunch. So um, he said he had a sleepless night after a 10 point game against Toronto. And he had a great game last night against Boston. So, and guys love playing with Bam. I think around the league, he's looked at as, um, you know, a guy people want to team with because he's so unselfish. He, he doesn't care about his own scoring or his own stats. He's going to, he's going to be on team, he teams that win a lot of games over his career. And uh, he's going to be a major reason for that. And I think he's one of the great – that he will be. Certainly Dwayne Wade holds the, 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 the uh, title for best recruiter in Heat history. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat Riley right there with him. But I think Bam is next with, in that regard. I think he's going to be a real – sort of recruiting magnet as a young all-star player uh, who's going to rally other guys that do probably want to play with him in the future in, in heat uniforms. I love it. So happy to see what is left in that guy's career. All right, it's time for the mental reps questionnaire, and we'll get you out of here. You ready? Yes, sir. Pop quiz, hot shot. Why so serious? What's in the box? What does Marcellus Wallace Look like. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? Answer the question, Claire. Are you telling me you built a time machine out of a DeLorean? You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Is Darth Vader my father? For real, B? I want answers! Without a good question, a good answer has no place to go. It's time for the Mental Reps Questionnaire. All right. Short answers is fine. If you could meet anyone current or historical and spend the day picking their brain, who would it be? Barack Obama. Good answer. All right. If you had one round trip ticket in a time machine, when and where would you go? Oh, great. I love to answer this question, even though the truth may be harmful uh, to some in Heat Nation that don't already know this. I would want to go back to Miami, Florida, Orange Bowl, January 12th, 1969. I was 11 years old. And I was at Super Bowl three with my dad the day that Joe Namath and the Jets changed professional football when the Jets beat Don Shula's Colts and in one of the epic upsets in Super Bowl history and a game that's looked at as one of the most important games in the history of the NFL. Um, yeah, if I could go back to any one event, that would be it. Great answer. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? 
Mm. Uh, wow. To live a long and healthy life, to watch my three beautiful children uh, grow up and, and enjoy their adult life and, and, and their dad get to see their families. That would be my one superpower I, I would love to tap into. It's a longevity or uh, at least a brief immortality. <laughs> Notice, I, I said not, not about he, being a heat announcer. That was uh, daddy and husband longevity. I get it. Obviously, man, I see you on Instagram. You look like it's such a beautiful family, and you really look like a, a great dad. Do you believe in ghosts? If so, explain. Or if not, explain. I kind of do. I kind of do. Mm. Okay. I had a crazy experience with a neighbor one time, and... Uh, um, whatever i house sat for them for a particular night and uh i knew the history behind that house and and i sort of felt a presence uh that night there and i don't know i don't know i'm, I'm not gonna say i don't believe so okay respectful fair, fair respectful. enough fair enough peace well, peace to the ghosts yeah right they're good ghosts they're nice ghosts <laughs> what's some wisdom you can share with anyone listening who's trying to pursue their dreams working in broadcasting uh, to jump over the, the, the hurdles that will invariably be placed before you. Um, a lot of people either get out or are forced out for other reasons, um, but it's, it's getting over those hurdles and obstacles and no, you're not ready yet. Um, and just find a way to, you know, if you have a chosen craft, to find a way to work on that craft so you can get better at it. Great answer. All right. And with the quote of the week, this is actually a quote from you. This is uh, your final send off to Wade. Uh, Thank you doesn't seem strong enough. How about we love you? We'll never forget you. And I'm going to take that quote and throw it right back at you, brother. We appreciate you as Heat fans. We love you. Thank you for being this wonderful constant in our lives, a professional, a good family man, a good person from anybody that I've heard who knows you. And uh, we're really blessed to have you down here in South Florida. I can't, uh, can't thank you enough for taking some time and talking with me today. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, man. I really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, you were so prepared and uh, passionate about the heat and uh, obviously kind to me. Uh, I got goosebumps when you use that line I, I use for Wade. You know, the coolest thing about that is um, totally spontaneous. You can't prepare for a moment like that. And that's, you know, it's crazy, but that, telecast for us, uh, the, the whole broadcast crew, Dwayne included, we got a regional end uh, for that 19 point loss. And I was, you know, when I heard that back, I was like, I was, I was so glad it came out like that. And uh, it was sincere and hopefully it lived up to that truly magical moment and night and career and player uh, that he was and that he gave us. And, and thank you for shining the light back on me, man. I don't need it, but, uh, it, it's nice to hear from somebody that cares about uh, the Miami Heat as much as you do, sir. Absolutely, man. No, no doubt this is a labor of love for you, but it does not come without sacrifice. You making every single game for all these years, it's, you know, it's, it's not easy. But uh, I just had to let you know that. And uh, please don't ever forget that. If you're at home and you're sitting back and ever stressed about anything on this planet, just know how much you mean to a lot of people here in South Florida and beyond. Uh, we really do care about you, man. You're a uh, local treasure. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. It's great, great, great knowing people like you. And uh, thank you for, for your time and for your kind words and thoughts. Thank you so much again for coming on, man. You have a great rest of your day. Appreciate it, buddy. Stay in touch. We'll do. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.